Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our program online at Mechanics Institute for Read Until You Understand, The Profound Wisdom of Black Life and Literature. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at Mechanics Institute, and we're proud to co-sponsor this event with the Museum of the African Diaspora, MOAD. Uh, and before we begin, um, I'd like to first uh, introduce Elizabeth Gessel, uh, Director of Public Programs uh, at MOAD to talk about what's coming up at the museum. So uh, please welcome Elizabeth and then uh, we'll continue. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Laura. My name's Elizabeth Gessel and I'm the Director of Public Programs at Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. MOAD is a contemporary art museum and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. Uh, we're thrilled to be partnering with Mechanics Institute um, on tonight's program. MOAD is open to the public. We have five stunning exhibitions on view through February 27th. So if you're in the Bay Area, come by and see us. And we continue to present a variety of virtual programs. Tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. will be our monthly open mic series with featured Daryl Alejandro Holmes. And on Thursday, February 24th at 6 p.m. will be our group reading with six poets who have written original ekphrastic poetry in response to our current exhibitions. Um, and that will be online as well. So you can learn everything about the museum and our virtual programs at moadsf.org. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Once again, it's great to co-sponsor with you. And for those of you who are, who are new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854 and we're one of San Francisco's most vital cultural and literary centers in the heart of the city. And we feature our general interest library and international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs and our cinema lit film series on Fridays. So please visit our website and also come down in person to 57 Post Street. I want to make mention that this program tonight is part of an NEH grant, Civil Rights, Artistic Diversity, Historical Reckoning, Exploring the Film, Literature, and Lives of Marginalized Communities, uh, which as mentioned is part of the National Endowment for Humanities. Also, if you would like to purchase books, uh, read until you understand the profound wisdom of Black life and literature, by our guest, Kara Jasmine Griffin, and also books by Julie Lithcott Haynes, who is our host tonight, um, are available through alexanderbook.com. So let me introduce our guests. In this elegant blending of memoir and a close reading of a wide range of works, including novels, poems, speeches, music, and art, Farah makes connections across gener gener genres and across generations, expanding the reader's experience of the words that bring us close to the human experience, mercy and justice, rage and resistance, democracy, love and death, grief and beauty. Her work brings us into her personal life and also into the words and inspirations of African-American literature, which offer us resilience, hope, and strength, especially during these times of racial injustice and social reckoning. We're in the company of two amazing writers tonight. Farrah Jasmine Griffin uh, was the inaugural chair of the African-American and African Diaspora Studies Department at Columbia University where she is also the William B. Ransford Professor of English and Comparative Literature. Griffin is the author of Who Set You Flowin', The African-American Migration Narrative. Also, If You Can't Be Free, Be a Mystery, In Search of Billie Holiday. And she's co-author with Salim Washington for Clawing at the Limits of Cool, Miles Davis, John Coltrane and the Greatest Jazz Collaboration Ever. And she co-authored Uptown Conversations, The New Jazz Studies, uh, and also Harlem Nocturne, Women Artists and the Progressive Politics During World War II. I'd also like to mention that she is a recipient of the 2021 Guggenheim Fellowship 
congratulations. And she comes to us from the Big Apple. So welcome from New York. Thank you. Thank and you. Julie Lithcott Haynes is the New York Times bestselling author of How to Raise an Adult, which gave rise to a popular TED Talk. And her second book is the critically acclaimed and award-winning prose poetry memoir, Real American, which illustrates her experience as a Black and a biracial person in white spaces. Her third book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult, has been called a groundbreaking frank guide to adulthood. Julie serves on the board of Common Sense Media, Black Women's Health Imperative, Narrative Magazine, and she's also on the board of trustees of the California College of the Arts. And she serves on the advisory boards of Learning.org, Parents Magazine, and Baldwin for the Arts. Uh, Julie lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her intergenerational family. So please welcome Farah Jasmine Griffin and Julie Lithcott Haynes. Thanks so much, Laura, for having us here to the Mechanic Institute. Um, I'm truly honored to get to be a part of uh, Professor Farah Jasmine Griffin's visit, air quotes, to the Bay Area tonight. Um, we'll take advantage of time zones that are mysteriously uh, magically happening uh, to make this event possible. Um, it's an honor to be here at the Mechanics Institute to know that MOAD is a co-sponsor. We're grateful, I know, to the audience members who've chosen to spend their Wednesday evening with us. And of course, I'm just delighted to get to be in conversation with, uh, with Farah. So let's get started. Farah, um, usually when I have the opportunity to be in conversation with a fellow author, I like to begin by asking, tell us who you are such that you came to be the person who wrote this book. And it feels especially apt tonight, given that your book, this incredible book, is called Read Until You Understand, which was a message imparted to you by your father who passed when you were quite young. Of course, I appreciate you may have some friends and some colleagues and fans of your work in the audience who know the origins of you that led you to pursue this field and the work that led to this book and the book itself. But for those who may be new to you, can you walk us through the arc of you becoming the person you are who is so devoted to black literary thought? Oh, wow, thank you. Um, that's, that's just a wonderful and generative question. First of all, thank you for taking the time to be in conversation with me. And like you, I also wanna um, thank the people who brought us here, the Canics and, and, and Moad. It's wonderful, um, even virtually to be in the Bay Area. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think that, you know, I, as I say in the book, I, 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 my love of um, African-American history primarily and then culture um, came through my father who shared, read to me and, and shared the excitement of reading um, and learning about our history here in this country and, and also in, out, outside of the nation as well. And I, um, you know, when my father died, I really kind of out of a sort of father hunger, um, you know, read the books that he left behind, um, mm -hmm. began to read them and then began to collect my own books. Um, mostly things that I thought my father would be interested in, uh, things that in some ways, ways that I departed from him. He was a real history buff. I fell in love with literature. I fell in love with literary prose and poetry and just, you know, it was one of those um, sort of life-changing things, the way reading can be for you. Uh, even then though, and I always wanted to be a writer from very early on, I wanted to be a writer. And luckily I came of age when there were all these extraordinary black women writers, um, Toni Morrison, Toni K. Bambara, and Tozake Shange, Alice Walker, Paul Marshall. Um, and so they were joined uh, to the kind of formal reading that I received in school which were mostly Western canonical writers. Um, but even then knowing how much I love literature and how much I wanted to write and how much I felt that um, particularly literature by black writers was very important to um, understanding this country 
I never thought that I would pursue it professionally. It just wasn't an option. I thought I was going to go to law school. In fact, I had every intention of going to law school. But I had two professors um, in college who suggested I think about graduate school um, and that I consider um, getting a PhD, uh, mm. which was completely foreign to me. But I, I, you know, investigated it and I thought, how self-indulgent to spend my life reading, writing, and teaching. Like, that, that's, that's what I should do for fun. But I did and um, have been teaching at the university level for the last 30 years, primarily African-American literature, um, but also cultural history, intellectual history. Uh, so a passion, I, I, I think I've been fortunate that a passion um, actually became um, a career for me. And the teaching, the great teaching that I received from my father, um, I think has certainly fed and nurtured my own teaching as well. So in a nutshell, that's how I, that's how I get here. I love it. I love it. We're glad you're here. We're glad you chose this path. Um, you are of tremendous inspiration uh, to those of us who have the privilege of reading your words. Um, I, I raised my hand when you said, uh, People suggested, I. you thought you were going to go to law school. I, I raised my finger because I went to law school. And I think what law and uh, the pursuit of historical analysis and um, writing about history in a literary way have in common is this really love of the power of language, the ability to wield words for impact. Um, two very different paths professionally, but they do have you know, some important things in common. I was also struck when you were talking about your early influences, um, as you spoke about Toni Morrison and Toni Cade Bambara and, and Tashaki Shange and others, I found myself picturing Lucille Clifton, who was my touchstone to Black life, Black female life, mothering, uh, body, um, being biracial, I, I have a white parent and a black parent. My mother happens to be white. And so I lacked a black mother and found in the poetry of Lucille Clifton, a literary black mother, such that my heart or my spirit said, as I was marking up Good Woman, which was the first text of hers that I was reading, my heart, my spirit said, if she is possible, if these words are possible, then maybe I too am possible. And so I feel this profound gratitude um, to a writer who came well before me, um, but whose work was so intimate, who, whose work revealed such an intimate aspect of her life that it felt um, entirely plausible that it could intertwine with mine and help me develop as a human. To me, your book, you mentioned canon, the Western literary canon, and we know what that means. Uh, we know who, whose faces and hair and skin color is included typically in the canon, and whose is not. And I really feel that your marvelous book, Read Until You Understand, is, is disrupting the canon um, or is soundly making the claim that a whole lot of other folks belong in the canon. To me, this is a literary historical text. It is a thorough compendium of the canon of Black thought, selected and presented in such an artful way that it feels like a treatise that reads like a novel. <laughs> we see how Phyllis Wheatley is the predecessor in thought of James Baldwin, who is the predecessor in thought to Toni Morrison on the subject of mercy. And we see how the founding documents of America, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence um, make their way into the rhetoric of the Black Panthers. And we see you as a young Black child whose father is taken too soon, facilitated by racism and indifference. We see you coming of age through Black literary thought. And we see through your recollection of it, Ta-Nehisi Coates, talking about how all these people in our ancestry were not all on the same page. He called it a brawl of ancestors, right? <laughs> so um, I want to ask, you've done so much with this. I, I imagine you are trying to move the needle with this book, 
but I want to ask you if that's true, if you are trying to move the needle, what needle are you trying to move and why this particular approach? Wow, you, you are a dream reader. Um, and you know what you say about um, Lucille Clifton is just, it, it proves exactly what I'm saying here, that, um, that we form relationships with writers and the words that they give us and that the words that they give us become part of our inheritance and our legacy. Um, and we, we define ourselves alongside or sometimes against what they've given us, right? but it, it's a very intimate, it's an intellectual relationship, but an intimate one. So to answer your question, um, you know, when you write a book, uh, you're writing it in a specific moment in time, and you're hoping that it will speak to a future, but you don't know what that future is. So um, this book comes out of a lifetime of learning, and I, one of the reasons why I take the approach that I take is I wanted to say, yes, I've learned how to read about and write about to do literary criticism and literary theory but my passion for this body of work did not start in graduate school. And I was taught that it had a level of importance beyond the intellectual um, or beyond the academic um, before I ever became an academic. It, had, it was an important work. So that's, it was important for me to give that personal narrative. I started writing it um, during the 2016 election before the results were in, yeah. but during that election. And I thought, wow, um, this tradition about which I know so much and that has shaped me has a lot to say about this democratic experiment that Americans would do well to listen to it. And it's not all they've talked about, but they've had some important things to say and have been invested in it reaching its ideals in ways that some of our fellow Americans have only been invested in word only, but not in action. And it was clear in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, I finished it uh, in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, I finished it with the kind of uprisings around George Floyd, which meant that what I had been writing about resonated even more. Right. And now I find myself talking about it in a period when they're trying to ban a lot of the books that I write about. <laughs> You know, so like it, it always seems urgent and important, you right. know, and it's one of the things that I tell my students when they take African American literature class with me, I say, you might not know it now, but I guarantee you something is going to happen this semester that's going to make this literature even more important. I wish it didn't happen, yeah. but it's going to happen. Yeah. Right. It speaks to the essential role writers play in yes. documenting, explicating, describing, prescribing. Yep, giving us the language for understanding what we're feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Not to pat right. ourselves on the back, but you know. Pat, pat, pat. Everyone here <laughs> loves writers, I know that. Okay, so I've been reading your marvelous book and telling everybody about it. Oh, what are you doing, Julie? Oh, I get to be in conversation with Jasmine Griffin. And you know, I'm reading this book and let me tell you what it is. I've, I've just had you um, with me you know, for, for a few days now. And um, as you said, I'm struck by how your material that is out in 2021 feels to be in direct response to what I'm reading in the news today, right? right. And um, to this very moment of refusal in some places to teach, to learn, to discuss, to understand our history. But I also know that books are not written overnight or in weeks or in months. Um, and take years, in fact. So um, the 2016 election, um, you know, I too had a book come out uh, that was written in that time, uh, my memoir, Real American. And I remember in my memoir using the term white supremacy to describe this drumbeat that I was hearing grow louder. And I worried a little bit that people might think I was overreacting. Don't call it white supremacy. Nobody tried to stop me, but as I went through the process of the manuscript becoming a book, I worried, and I, I did get a little bit of pushback, um, but, but you know, they were, they were encouraging, keep going. And of course, now nobody would bat an eyelash that we're talking freely about white supremacy. Um, so let me ask, how, how does the fact of this book being so steeped in 400 years of literary black thought how does it speak to our 
present challenge of the banning of the books and of the refusal to remotely understand what critical race theory is, how does this, how, is this in some ways a solution? Is there, is there a way that this particular approach that you've come up with can serve us in this moment? I think it can. I mean, I think it, you know, I mean, just the fact that, you know, the, the, so many of the books are books that are being banned, right? right? And what I say when I'm interviewed about these things is I say, look, nobody's trying to teach Beloved to a seven-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. They're teaching Beloved to a high school AP student if they're lucky. And I can guarantee you that's not the first time they're learning about sex is in Beloved. Like it's a guarantee, right? But the truth of the matter is I think what, what, what my book shows is that I read everything when I was a little girl. Like, and nobody was, my mother wasn't saying you can't read that. It was on the shelf, I read it. Yeah. And if I didn't understand it, someone, some adult in my life, my mother, my father, my teacher, the librarian, would talk to me about it, right? Mm -hmm. That every opportunity is an opportunity. Like we're so afraid of talking to our children about difficult issues. But I also know, I think that the book and all the books I write about, Julie, and what you write about, I think it does speak to the moment. But the people who are most hysterical about banning books are not readers. Right. Right. <laughs> readers, <laughs> readers don't ban books, right? These aren't people, the books that they want to ban, they haven't even read. You know, they've taken a passage out of context or something. Um, so that there is a kind of hysteria that I think is an almost, it's just very difficult to rationalize with, but we have to bear witness to your kids are going to be okay. Yeah. And they're going to be even more okay if you let them read and you yeah. let them read about truthfully about the experience of how this nation came into being, yeah. you know? And, you know, I think about a young person who picks up your memoir, won't have had the same exact experience that you had, right? It's a unique experience to you, but there will be things that they recognize that you give meaning to, the nervousness of going out on the dance floor, you know? Um, the the I mean, the, the embarrassing moment, the concern, there will be moment, things that you have given, you've given such humanity to that little girl who they might feel they don't know, mm. that they will connect with her. Mm. So yes, all of these books speak to our moment, as, mm. as books throughout time always speak to all of our moments. That's why we still read Homer, for God's sake, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you for that. Um, you know, when you mentioned um, certain things being taken out of context by people who may not be reading at all or have only read the tiny little thing. Um, it reminds me of the part of your book where you acknowledge that the controversy that Reverend Wright experienced as uh, Barack Obama's pastor and Obama experienced as he's running for president, you know, and he has to address that. So many of the people who were condemning Obama for the audacity of having had this preacher in his life had only read a snippet or two. You know, yep. they were, he was totally being read out of context and how Obama had to figure out what the truth of that was, figure out what the politics of it was, figure out how to thread this needle um, that Obama chose to thread the way he did around race and our history. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's sort of, history becomes a collage. Uh, who, what, what happened? Who yeah. had the privilege to write it down in the first place? And how did they narrate to it given their biases, right? Did that last through time? What snippets of it do we have? You know, we regard, it really big opens up big questions. I think like, what is truth yes. and what is history, right? Um, I should ask you, what is your definition of history? Well, I mean, I think there's the, there's the history that we write Right, and and it's and the historiography, which is fascinating, um, that is fully and always shaped by the moment. Right, mm -hmm. so our interpretation of the past. Right now, we're going through a period where people are thinking more and more outside of the academy about the history of the Reconstruction period. Right, so we know how Reconstruction was. You know, there was Reconstruction that happened, and then there was the ideological interpretation of it in order to um, you know, take back all the wins and gains of Reconstruction, you had to say that it was 
a fool's errand with a bunch of idiotic black people and their, their opportunistic white allies in order to take away their vote and <laughs> disenfranchise them and roll back all of those gains. And then you have someone screaming in the wilderness like a Du Bois in 1934 saying, no, you're wrong. Yeah. But that doesn't become the dominant way of understanding it in the academy right. until many years later. Right. And Eric Foner writes that record. And now we have PBS <laughs> giving us the documentary that says actually some really progressive things happened. And had we stayed that course, we right. might not be where we are today. So there's what happened and we say, there's who writes about it, how they interpret it, how they use it to justify what they're doing in the moment. Yeah. Right. That's what it is. And PBS has a documentary that's basically saying, had we not stayed the course, we wouldn't be where we are today. In other words, we made some progress then that put us in a better position now than we would otherwise have been. Right. Okay. I was going to say the opposite. No, no. I, yeah. I think that's what it, yeah. It's the opposite it's actually. The opposite. Yeah. yeah. Had we stayed the course. Right. We would have been, got you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because what, you know, I have to um, admit that I felt both tremendous hope and optimism and also a bit of despair in reading the cyclical nature of the rhetoric of what was happening to our people yeah. and what was being said by others about us and so on and these efforts, you know, and you bring up reconstruction and that has been top of mind for me um, in the last two years. That is, we seem to have had yet another capstone event if the emancipation of the slaves and the end of the Civil War was the sort of capstone event of the 19th century regarding race. Um, and then we had reconstruction for this brief period and then it ushered in this tremendously long period of, of violence and restraint and sorrow. I see the parallels to Obama's capstoning the civil rights movement of the 20th century and becoming elected and the concurrent rise in white nationalism and white supremacy and now the restriction on voting rights. And it just feels like, my God, whomever said those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it is sort of holding their hand on their forehead right now, looking at us humans like, come on. But I think what I also can appreciate is history is unwieldy. It isn't all recorded accurately to the extent there is any such thing. It isn't all recorded broadly. We only write up the history of the victor and their, their loudest detractors. And um, uh, so it is an unwieldy thing to know our history so as to not be doomed to repeat it. But we have to start somewhere. Frankly, I think we should start with your book. I think this should be assigned in every high school. Um, I think every teacher should have to read it. And um, but I but I do want to ask you, you know, how if we were trying to stop this moment that seems to be upon us of it feels like both an encroachment and a, you know, a many, many, many steps back all at once. So it has this velocity it's moving forward and yet it's an undoing. How would we take these thinkers, these writers, these words that they use and help people? Like, what would you point to as the moment your book can illustrate? Like, look, this is where we're on the edge of this cliff and here's how we know, because we've been here before and I can show you the language that was used before. And we now look back at it and say, oh, if only. Yeah. You know, like what? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, that's so hard, Julie. I mean, I think you're so right. Like for instance, um, I think that there are things that we take for granted. I think that some people took for, even if they, you know, for whatever reasons they didn't want to vote in 2016 or they didn't want to vote a certain way or whatever. If for nothing else, um, one of the things that we had to think about was the courts. Like that was, you know, if for nothing else, because this history teaches us what the courts can do, yeah. right? Um, and what, you know, this history teaches us like what happens so you get a Dred Scott or what happens so that you get a Plessy v. Ferguson and you get a Plessy v. Ferguson in the 1890s that makes segregation the law of the land and it takes until the 1954 mm -hmm. for Brown to turn it back and still there's a backlash against that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, so that's just one example. But the other example that I think is probably more pertinent is, um, and is that so that every time people pop up and fight it back or feel like we can't fight it back, 
I think that there are ample examples in the book that there is also a tradition of fighting it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That there is, and one of the reasons why I chose to write the Rage and Resistance chapter the way that I did was that I was writing it, I was finishing it as we were going through the Black Lives Matter and things were happening in Philadelphia and different places. And I said, those young people out in the street in Philadelphia, I hope they know that they are standing in a tradition that yeah. Philadelphia was always this place where there were these um, really sort of radical activists, anti-slavery activists, so that when the fugitive slave law was passed, we talk about civil disobedience, when yeah. the fugitive slave law was passed, um, and there will be versions of that, you know, yeah. that there were people who said, not on our watch, yeah. not while we're alive. You can pass that law, but you're not going, we're going to free a fugitive who comes to Philadelphia. You know, yeah. we're going to, we're going to get on the boat and take this woman off of the boat from her master because she is in a free territory. And this was black abolitionists and radical Quakers, and we'll go to jail for it, but yeah. that's what we're going to do. So that there's this contest over what Philadelphia is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the lesson. The lesson is yeah. that you can't take it lying down yeah. and you don't have a tradition of taking it lying down, right? Yeah. That we've been fighting and that you have to, comp that each generation has to fight it. You have to fight something new. Yeah, and, and each move, generation. Yeah, and, and you move the needle a little bit further. Right. Hopefully. And each generation has had allies. That's yeah. a relatively new term, but what you just described Always. Always. With allyship, right? Always. Allyship, brave people putting their own bodies on the line with their privilege. Yes. To go get this, you know, formerly enslaved woman whose slave master had come and claimed her again yes. and keep her free. Always had allies. I mean, like, you know, that chapter I write about Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who's one of my favorite, favorite figures in history. And, you know, she's on the road. And after Harper's Ferry happens, she writes to John Brown and she writes to his men. And she says, um, first of all, thank you for what you did, what you tried to do. Because they're imprisoned. They're in prison. They're about, to be they're about to be executed. Yeah. So she writes to them and she says, and whatever I can do for your widows, mm. black, white, all of you, whatever I can send to your widows, I will send to your widows. Yeah. And one of them, his her letter to him is found in his belongings after he's executed. Right. And you're right. These were, these were allies <laughs> in the genuine sense of the word and were they complicated of course human yeah. beings are complicated absolutely yeah yeah but few of us derive a sense of being alive from complacency you know to really live is to serve is to do the work is to be of use to others is to have that purpose and that passion right absolutely and and there's a joy i mean i try to show the joy that comes yeah. Right. It's not a joyless you existence. You do. You do. And let's get to that. So the subjects in this marvelous book are um, you've got about, I don't know, I haven't counted like 10 or 12 chapters and 10 chapters. And they you mentioned one of them just now, rage and resistance, but it's legacy, love and learning, the question of mercy, black freedom and the idea slash ideal of America the quest for justice, rage and resistance, death. These are all things about which thought leaders have opined, right? And you do this beautiful job of weaving together the thought leaders from earliest into the middle, into the present. And, and that's what makes it this incredible historical treatise of thought. Um, but then chapters seven, eight, nine, and 10 take a pivot. Yes. They're a little bit softer. Yes. The transformative potential of love joy and something like self-determination, cultivating beauty and gardens and grace. And so I, I want to know what you were, what choices were you making? And of all the things you might have decided to reduce 400 years of thought and lived Black experience down to, you chose these 10 chapters. Like wh what? what's the rationale behind this particular construct? Sure. Um, there's a lot. Uh, one is um, I wanted to show that these are things that human beings have thought about throughout time since our existence on this planet. Um, and we, we've thought about death and we've thought about love. Uh, we you know, that grace pops up in all kinds of spiritual traditions and joy is a part of who we are and what we experience. So that was why I wanted to have it there to show that, you know, it wasn't only the Greeks and the Romans who thought about this stuff. Um, 
But also, I think, you know, there is a way that we can look at Black life. Um, and if we think about the truth of premature Black death and violent Black death and rage and fighting and, and prejudice, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a pretty dismal way of being, right? It's a, it makes being Black dismal. And being Black is nothing if not dismal. I mean, it's full of beauty and creativity and innovativeness and joy. And yes, suffering as well, but they're all, it's all there. And so I wanted a reminder, a touchstone that these other parts of the human condition are in this experience as well. And I also, you know, I make, I make my readers join me on some very difficult, painful subjects. And I wanted to give them a breath, a chance to breathe, yeah. um, a gift, yeah. you know? Um, and I wanted to end on those notes. Those are the notes that I, so you're absolutely right that, that there is a shift toward the end that moves us into beauty, joy, love, and grace. Yeah. I can tell you in the most um, literal manner, I felt the insurrection coming. My body in the fall of 2020 began to fear the impending destructiveness of white nationalism reclaiming its country. I, you know, I'm not saying I could foretell the future, but simply that I was reading the news and paying attention and didn't have the luxury to not pay attention. And um, so much so that I called my niece, Shade Lifcott. She's the CEO of the National Black Theater in Harlem, which was founded by her mother, Dr. Barbara Ann Teer. And for 50 years, the National Black Theater in Harlem has been foregrounding Black joy and our stories and our, uh, our, uh, our thriving. And I said to Shade, I'm so afraid. You know, I'm so afraid of what's coming. I'm afraid of the people who are going to be hurt. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm privileged and I live in, out here in California. I've got this light skin. I'm upper middle class. I, I'm not saying I'm on the front lines of this battle right now, but I'm an empath and I ache for the people whose lives are going to be lost to this violence. And she said to me, she breathed, she sighed and joy filled her voice. And she said, Julie, I hear your compassion for others. But if I may, your concern is rooted in oppression and I want you to root your concern in our liberation. And it was just a reframe of, you know, where, where will, what will I stand upon in order to do what I do next? Is it going to be fear and oppression and those memories, or is it going to be memories of our continual ability to liberate and strive and thrive and find joy in our Black lives? Um, you mentioned readers, and I have to ask, as we, we are asked when we write books, who's your audience? And I do feel that there are a number, you know, some two distinct audiences. There are Black folk and then non-Black folk. Uh, for Black folk, I feel like you're saying, look, look, listen to us over time. Listen to our forebears and all the things they wrestled with. You know, you've got this because look what we've, Right. There's this sort of restorative nature of being grounded in the in the rhetoric and and efforts of our forebears. And you also demonstrate what has sustained us through all of that. But then I think for non-black audiences, there's this kind of look, look, you may not have been taught. Black people did this, thought this, capable of this. They didn't all agree. We weren't a monolithic group. And so I, I don't know who you had in mind or if you had a primary and secondary and tertiary set of audiences in mind, but can you speak to that? How do you write a book like this knowing that almost any human might pick it up and, and what are you offering differently depending on who they are? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that I thought about all those people. <laughs> so, you know, I certainly thought about black people like, you know, this is your inheritance and your legacy, right? Um, just because I write about it as my inheritance and legacy. I thought about it as, you know, I was like, look, Americans, like we are, on, and, and like you, same thing. You know, we felt it in 2016. Right. Like if they had listened to us in 2016, we were like, wait a minute, this is coming. Right. Like we can feel it. We see it. We saw it in the Tea Party. We right. knew. Right. We, we, we know what it is when we yeah. see it. That's and right. we're not being hysterical or irrational. Right. Um, and so I thought, look, if you really claim that you care about this place, 
and you care about these ideals, you know, and you care about those buildings on the mall, right? You care about what they stand for. These people have helped to shape those ideas too. Yeah. And they, have, they might give you a way to think so that you can preserve them and make them better, make, make them live up to what they're supposed to do. So that these institutions are living, right? These words and documents are living because it's very fragile and there's a whole lot of folk who don't believe in it, especially they don't believe in it when we start applying it to people who are not white, when it really means, when it really means freedom and equality for all, right? They would rather take it all down. Right. Than it, right they would rather go down with it right, right. and so you That's should be listening to these writers too and then i just thought because i know readers i'm a reader you know and i frequent bookstores and libraries and so it was also a kind of love letter to readers no mm. matter who you are you know yeah. the nerdy kid who's a reader the all of us <laughs> readers yeah. those of us who read and write books i thought you're a book lover because this is a book about books it's a book about my family but it's also a book about books. So I had all of those audiences in mind and um, I haven't been disappointed because I've had responses from all of them. I'm sure you have, you definitely nailed it across the board. Um, as I mentioned to you before, everybody joined us. And let me just say as a matter of uh, procedure to those in the audience, we're glad you're here. We're gonna open it up to your questions in about seven minutes. So don't worry that I'm just gonna keep yammering on, okay? You're gonna get your chance. Um, but as I mentioned to you, Farah, in before everybody got out of the waiting room, I happened to be simultaneously preparing for this event, reading your marvelous book, while also uh, reading uh, a memoir that's coming out uh, by A.J. Verdell, who's a novelist, and she's now written a memoir about her literary friendship with Toni Morrison called Miss Chloe. Right. And I discovered to my delight that A.J. and you were in the same place um, doing a fellowship and um, you know each other. So you were showing up in each other's books, which was kind of mind blowing and cool. Um, and what I couldn't help but take away from your book and from A.J.'s book is that whether we're talking about you or Toni Morrison or A.J. Verdell or frankly, Amanda Gorman, um, whose rise has taught us about her upbringing as a child, all of you as young black girls were readers. You were all very literate and leading a liter literary life as children. And that cannot help but have transformed you. It is evident, it is obvious that reading begets knowledge, connection, belonging, intention, and the power to wield words to make others pay attention. But I was struck in AJ's book, Miss Chloe, that she says as a professor um, at Morgan State University and HBCU, so she's been teaching young people for decades as you have, that her task is to inspire them to hunger for what's available in books. And it's gotten harder with social media and technology making everything kind of bite-sized and quick. I wonder if perhaps you've noticed this in your, in your years at Columbia. I think my question here is, how do we get our children? And when I say our children, I mean all children um, and black children in particular, how do we get our children to read? to hunger for the experience that you had and that led to this life of inquiry and curiosity and impact, you know, how do we bring reading back as the thing, the portal that opens you to the past, to yourself and to the future? You know, I mean, I think there is, there's so many competing things now. We didn't have social media, you know, um, and, and, and social media has done something to our attention span. You know, I have um, young people in my life who can't even watch, like there's certain movies that I love because they're slow and they're languorous and they linger on a face and they're like, oh my God, it's too slow, <laughs> you know, yep. right? Because they're used to, but I do think with very, very young people, um, I think the way you get them to love reading is you read with them and you, you, they love you, they love being with you and being with you means that you read together. And that, that was me with my father. Like, you know, I, like I love being with my father. If, and if he had taken me to the baseball field, you know, he loved baseball, but he never took me to the baseball field. Right? He took yeah. me to the bookstore and the library. So I think very young people, we read with them and to them. Um, we have them read to us. We make it something pleasurable. What I've noticed with my students, the college students is 
the pandemic was actually interesting because it forced us to slow down, stop. I had to change my syllabus. And instead of making them rush through books for an exam, I said, you know what? We're not gonna do all these books. We're gonna read very slowly together. And we were all so lonely and alone that we came together over a reading, right? Yep. And it created community. It created, it created a sense of community and a sense of purpose. And so I think it's almost creating the settings in which we give books and reading to young people, whether they are students, little, little kids or college students, um, that sometimes we have to shift the way we present things to them. You know, start with a Lucille Clifton poem. Who's not gonna find something that blows their mind and knocks them off their feet at the same time in a Lucille Clifton poem, right? Start with that. You know, you also speak to music. In the chapter, I think, Joy and Self-Determination, you bring music in. All, you know, for 180 pages or whatever, I'm reading about how words and books are the thing for you. And then you basically say, you know what, actually, music even more so, right? right? You yeah. say, for it was not only the written word that shaped and formed my understanding of the world around me. In fact, it was not even primarily books. Music, more than anything, helped to define us in ways that were life-giving. And later in that chapter, you speak to the pandemic and something that the uh, DJ D Nice did early in pandemic, early, you know, like March, May, early spring 2020. He went live on Instagram for nine hours and all of these hundreds of thousands of people participated. Wow. And I found my, and then Kendrick Lamar years ago, recently though, won the Pulitzer Prize. Like we have, and we have the Super Bowl performance and, you know, these West Coast hip hoppers with their narrative. I wonder if music, because I see the power of TikTok and, yeah. um, and there's tremendous content on TikTok. If somehow music is the way back to the word, right? you know, um, because we know young people love and will always love music. And of course, lyrics are tiny little stories. Yeah. And it just got me thinking about is music a way for us to be a collective again, to be joined in joy and laughter and leisure and the snap of a finger and the swing of a hip and the collective recita recitation of a familiar lyric. Um, I, I just saw a glimmer of hope somehow in music and wonder what your thoughts are about who in music today, I know this question may be a little out of left field, um, do you feel is unifying us? Who's, who are the, and maybe even broader than music, if you want to just opine on kind of popular thinkers, who are the prophets? Who are the wisest ones? Who are the unifiers right now? Yeah, I mean, I think that music always does that. Music always does it, it you know, and like the Stevie Wonder is a huge, you know, character in that chapter. And D, DJ G Nice just showed like we needed healing. We needed to be brought together. You know, we were alone, but we were together with what he gave us. And so I, I do think that the music does that. There's a young singer who's not a very popular singer, but my students turned me on to her named Jamila Woods who has a beautiful voice and, is, and if um, people out in our audience tonight wanna to look for a clip of her on, um, I think it was on Stephen Colbert and it might've been the night of the insurrection. Mm. She performs a song um, called Sula oh. and inspired ah. by and words from um, Sula. Morris and Sula because so many of these young um, artists are, they are readers. They're yeah. also readers, you okay. know? And um, so they are interpreting, um, the language and they are also in they're 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 artists with of language certainly the the hip hop artists are the the hip hop stars are um manipulating language and word and metaphor and so i think you're right i think that that music is a way in um it's a way to bring us back together yeah. um, absolutely i think so another um watching um questlove's film summer of soul mm. uh, did it for me as well, because it was like, yes, the music is like inspiring, but the artists are also inspired by. And then I'm also thinking like, what were people writing that summer? Like, what were people reading that summer? Because the, what we're reading is always in concert with what we're listening to. They both are creating the moment yeah. at the same time. Nice. 
but we have reached the magical point where I'm supposed to give it over to <laughs> Laura or someone else is going to come back in and field some questions or Pam perhaps. So over to y'all. <laughs> Okay, so um, we have a couple of questions in uh, in chat. One is from um, Eleanor Higginbotham. Dr. Griffin, I am using your book in a class I'm about to teach. I chose to teach classics in African American art as a way of responding to what our country has witnessed these past few years. Then your book came out and I gave a name and gave a name to what I was trying to do. I am moved by it as by the texts about which you write so eloquently. My question is one of appropriation. Yours is such a personal story and response. As an elderly white woman who wants to do something, how do I use your book and these texts in a classroom for other folks of a certain age and good hearts? Oh, wow. I mean, I'm so grateful that you know, you're using it and that you're finding it useful and that it's, um, you know, all literature belongs to all of us through time. Like, you know, and yes, I do have a, I give a personal, um, you know, way into my own personal way into so many of the text. But I, as I talk about, you know, you know, you'll find me borrowing similes and metaphors from Fitzgerald um, or saying that I fell in love with Edith Wharton of the way she wrote about class. Um, and so I think that these books belong to all of us, you know, that are there to shape our minds. We don't, we, we feel like you probably, and your readers probably have more in common with the writers about whom I write than we have with Ovid <laughs> or even Shakespeare, right? Yeah. Who still speaks to us nonetheless, right? Um, and we claim, uh, Ralph Ellison said that, um, I think I get it confused. He talks about literary relatives and literary ancestors. I don't know which one is which, but there's one set that we choose, that we, we get to choose. Um, and they can be made up of people from all time and all places. So thank you for thank you for reading the book and for teaching it and take it as you will. Okay, the next question is from Jean Powell. May I add you to my short list of books I recommend when white people ask me about race? The others on the list are Toni Morrison, Source of Self-Regard, and Isabel Wilkerson, Castle. Yeah, so um, please, I would be honored to be in the company with <laughs> Toni and Isabel Wilkerson, Castle. Um, I would be honored. You know, there's a, there's a body of literature that is um, out, the kind of anti-racist literature I know that became very popular and important um, during the moment, particularly following George Floyd. And it's very important literature. I, I don't consider my work in that body of literature, but certainly um, literature that is about black people and our humanity and therefore about human beings um, that can maybe shed some light on the issues of race in this country and in the world. Uh, by all means, I, I would be honored to be added to that group of people. Yes. And, and Jean also asks, what influence did Bell Hooks have on your perspective? She moved from rage to love in her writing. Yeah, um, I do quote Bell in the um, chapter on love because it's almost impossible to write about love in the context of Black Americans. And so I do all about love. I do quote all about love in that book. Um, and I think in that chapter, she and Baldwin are the sort of figures that helped me have the architecture. And it's probably that chapter more than anything else where, where um, one could see the influence of her, the, the later Bell, the, the Bell who writes about love is, is there on my own work. Well, I don't see any other, maybe in another minute, somebody will, will post another question. I don't see any, um, any right now. Oh, oh, but uh, Trish Gorman, what is, what can you, can you tell us what your, can you type in the chat what your question is or? Uh, oh, can I say it? All right, all right. Yeah, yeah I just, it's not really a question as much as a, as a comment, which is the title of this book that you've written, which I will now read, really intrigued me after I saw it and signed up for the, it kept reverberating because as a white woman, 
you know, I, I had conceived of myself as a person who was not a racist and didn't need to, you know, I got, every, I got the picture. This is talking about myself about three years ago. And of course, because of what's, I'm in two book clubs. One is a women's book club. And we're re, every other book we read in the last year had to do with America, Black Americans. And then I'm in, I also manage a book club, which is the League of Women Voters of Oakland book club, in which we also reading many books about race. And it's like, every time I, I read one, I'm like, oh my God, you know, I mean, and, it just goes on and on the depth of it. And then I think I'm a white woman. I'll never, never, never really understand. Yeah. You know, anyway, it's just a comment. And, and when I think about what's going on with this book banning, it really, it is like, it's a fear of white people of understanding. Because if they understand, they're going to have to change. I'm going to have to change. We're going to have to change. We white people. So anyway, I just love the title on its own. It has really stimulated so much thought for me. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, the title actually comes from a note that my father wrote to me in a book when I was nine years old. And the book was called Black Struggle. And he said, baby, read this until you understand. He says, you may not understand it at first but read it. If you have questions, ask your teacher. She will help you, um, but read it. And then he would go through the chapters and say, start here. There's lots of Frederick Douglass. And so, um, so he was telling me to read until I understand. And as a little girl, I thought he meant like, until I understood it, I absolutely, I would reach the point of understanding. And as an adult, I realized that it's a process, it's not a destination. And that if, if I read until I understand, it means a lifetime of reading a lifetime of being committed to learning. And that the one thing, the more I learn, the more I know what I don't know. Right. right. right? Mm -hmm. And it's actually ends up, it, it can be very frustrating because I'm like, I'm never gonna know all of this. And it's not because you're a white woman, it's because we just can't know it all. <laughs> so at first it's like, I'm never gonna know all of this. And then I think, wow, what an exciting life I'm gonna have because I'm gonna be trying to learn until the end. I'm gonna be reading and trying to learn until the very end. So, a lifetime of reading. Thank so, um, Julie said that she'd like to interject a question. I had one question that was coming up. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, you you made this lovely comment. You hope when when we write, when we do our work, we hope it'll speak to a future, and we yet don't know what that future is. You said that um, earlier on in our conversation, and it reminded me that in your book you talk about how Barack Obama said that the constitution left the question of slavery to future generations. Whereas Frederick Douglass saw our liberation embedded in the constitution. Obama said, no, uh, they really punted and left that very difficult issue for future generations. And so it, it makes me wonder today, what are the compromises we are making on our watch right now that fut that we're punting to future generations, what are they gonna look back upon us having done and regard our behavior as having been unforgivable? I think, um, you know, some of those things will be around race, but even more importantly, they'll be around what we're doing to the planet and our refusal to our, you know, our waiting so long to doing to do what we know we needed to do to save our planet um, and to to address climate change um, and to entertain people who actually entertain and compromise with people who um, claimed that it wasn't happening. Right? That those were those are the kinds of things that if if we are alive, if we survive as a species. I think that future generations will be very upset with us that we're punting on. And I think that we, we, we punt on many things. I mean, I think every time we feel like we, um, we have a history in this country of making compromises on the backs of Black people over and over and over again, whether it be um, ending slavery when we could have, when we wrote the Constitution, um, because the Southern states didn't want us to end it. And not only didn't want us to end it, we gave them more power, yeah. we gave them more power. You know, and, and to explain to young people what the three-fifths clause really means, it doesn't mean that 
a black person was three fifths of a human being, it meant that they got extra votes <laughs> for people who couldn't vote. That's what it meant, right? And so we to look at all the time we make compromises, like this voting rights stuff right now. Like in 1965, you probably couldn't have said that we would be where we are now. Um, and yet here we are, and we are willing to make compromise, you know? So I think that those are the kinds of things, but the stuff around the planet and climate, I think is really going to be one of our young people are going to be. Yeah. You know, sometimes people say, what do we do? What should we do? What should we do? And a thought that I've been having recently is let's take the banned books list and let's form book clubs um, around the banned books. You know, let's have a book club reading for middle schoolers and high schoolers where we facilitate them in the reading of these man books. I saw some kind of social media image the other day that said no child has ever died from reading banned books. But of course, they're dying constantly in schools because we have this rampant out of control gun culture. Right. right? So right. we have a reading culture. The thing is, you about my AJ reading and my reading and, you know, my father didn't expect the schools to teach me black history. Like he didn't expect them to. Now we have gotten to the point where we're rightly so. We want all of our children to know black history. But my father read to me books that he knew I wasn't gonna get in school, right? That, yeah. that and, and, and I think that there, like, there were book clubs and there were reading groups and our librarians did it for us. Yeah. So yes, I agree, I yeah. agree. Okay, I'm gonna to get to work on you, Julie. You and I can talk all night. So. I look look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. You know, Pam, there's a question here from uh, Jeannie who says to Farah, "Did you consult any books of interviews with formerly enslaved people?" Oh uh, yes. Um, you know, I I I first read some of those interviews, now they're available online, but I actually read the volumes of them in graduate school. I read all of the Georgia WPA slave narratives, and then I went into the Alabama ones. Um, and so less so for this book, more so for my first book, I cite some of those narratives. Um, but they're always, those voices are always in the back of my head. Um, absolutely. Mostly here, they're the, what I talk about are, are the books that were published. Right on. And I'm seeing a question here. Someone's direct messaged me with a question. Uh, Robert Kaufman wants to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, actually, I really just wanted to thank the two of you. Um, this has really been incredible. And I also just wanted to say uh, to Professor Griffin, it's one of these rare circumstances where, although it's virtual, um, it's a chance to say thank you for uh, decades of work. I'm been lucky enough to uh, be a teacher of literature and to get to point students for years and years to your work. Uh, it's opened so many doors and ears and eyes for them. Um, and the crossings, uh, the depth of the work on literature itself, but its connections to music and both of them to history, uh, they, they've just been so generative for so many of the students I've taught and before that for me and with them. So. Thank you both again very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also, before we uh, bring our program to a close, Farah, I'm just wondering if you'd like to do a reading for us from your book, a short reading. We'd love it. It would be such a pleasure. Oh, wow. I, I hadn't thought about that. So yes, I, I'll, do, I'll do something. Um, I will actually read to you from the very end of the book. <laughs> um, it won't. It won't. Um, it won't ruin it. <laughs> my Aunt Eartha, my mother's middle sister, loved yellow roses. When I moved back to Philadelphia as a young professor in 1993 and purchased my first home, a pair of adjacent townhouses in a gentrifying neighborhood within walking distance of my childhood home, she gave me a rose bush that promised to yield bright yellow flowers. So you will have something to remember me when I die, she told me. I believe because I did not want to think of a time when she was no longer in my life, I neglected the plant. And when I relocated my mother from our South Philadelphia row house to one of my townhouses, she rescued the bush and replanted it in her own garden. Now, long after I moved from Philadelphia to New York and over a decade since my aunt's passing, the bush still blooms. The women in my family loved flowers and plants. After my father's death, my mother used some of his life insurance money for a variety of home repairs 
including replacing the fence around our teeny yard, which she had re-cemented as well. My cousin did most of the work and he created a space for a garden bed. Two memories of my mother's garden stand out to me. The first isn't really about the garden, but about the wild honeysuckle vine that grew attaching itself to the row of fences in the alley behind our yard. And after a summer rain, the scent was thick and intoxicating. I remember the contrast that the alley, a place of danger that my playmates and I were warned to avoid, could also yield such perfumed pleasure. The second memory is of my mother in her garden, and it stands out to me in its quiet power and significance. I was at the kitchen sink, looking out the window at her as she watered her garden with a green hose. And afterward, she stood there looking at the flowers. I saw her gently point her index finger. And as if it had been summoned, a large graceful butterfly flew from the clothesline to land on her finger where it seemed to rest for an eternity. Two inexplicable gifts, the serenity and beauty of the butterfly I give to my mother, the entire scene framed by the wooden window like a painting, a gift for me. Flowers are objects of gratuitous beauty. And while I know there are scientific reasons for their variety of shape, shade, color, scent, nonetheless, they seem to exist just to give us a glimpse of their glory. And noticing them, attending to them, admiring them is, is an expression of gratitude. Our attentiveness to and expressions of gratitude for them is a prayer of sort. They, like the songbirds overhead, are a reminder that though the world is full of ugliness, meanness, hatefulness, there is always also this, grace, unmerited reward given to humans by the divine. Just gonna finish. There is nothing we can do to earn it. It just is. It is, right is the final line in the version that I'm yes, in the, yeah. That's it. That's yeah. It. And the, the, there's um, one, one, one poem that I'll leave you with. Um, and it's from Rita Dove that's in this chapter. It's called Evening Primrose. They'll wait until the world's tucked in and the sky's one ceaseless shimmer, then lift their saturated eyelids and blaze, blaze all night long for no one. So yes, that's it. Thank you. I want to thank Farah Jasmine Griffin for her amazing book, um, Read Until You Understand. And thank you, Julie Lithcott Haynes, for moderating and guiding us through this conversation. And please, everyone, continue your reading continue this conversation as we try to heal our nation and bring bring forth change that we need so desperately um, with with everyone's participation and contribution that's what we need now so once again thank you again everyone for your participating in tonight's program and join us as we go forward uh, either on zoom or in our meeting room at Mechanics Institute. And uh, continue reading, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.